All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, one thing I know about myself when I present things is I tend to go a little fast. So that we don't run through this, I'm going to try to take my time. I'm going to go down some rabbit holes maybe if they come up, and uh, we'll just go through the whole thing. So you would have gotten a handout. Um, the handout actually goes a little odd. Um, the bottom left is actually the first, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. <laughs> don't know why that is. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. So. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, we're going to be talking about the philosophy of religion today, and um, it's interesting because when I was thinking about this as I was working on it, I realized it's actually kind of a supplement to what Dana did a few months ago when Dana did the class on apologetics, because a lot of this feeds into apologetics. Um, a lot of the philosophy of religion is the discussion of, you know, does God exist, right? And is it reasonable and rational to believe in God? And you, what you'll find is that in many cases, the arguments don't necessarily take a Christian view. They simply take a view of, is it rational to believe that there is something that's God? And it's more of a more baseline, like, is, is it worth it to even believe? And um, what, we, what you do with these is then you can use these to build on each other and then show them hey, if, you can, if it's rational enough to believe that there is one, let me explain to you why the Christian one is the one that is real. And so to start with on that, I've got the first things first, which is nothing comes before the gospel, okay? The gospel is, you know, our one truth and our calling to share, okay? It can cut through people and get into them better than anything. But there are people out there who just have walls built up and are... You know, you can share the gospel with them a hundred times and they're never going to pay attention to it because either through their own beliefs or through indoctrination or through whatever, they just don't accept the idea that believing in God makes any sense. They believe that you're just a loony and that you're wasting your time. And so these arguments that have been passed down through centuries and even millennia um, can work toward hitting that wall and say, well, no, it's really not crazy to believe in this. And let me explain to you why, based on what we know. And um, through that, we can try to engage them and maybe poke a few holes in that wall um, that then as they continue to be exposed to it, they might become more warmed up to the gospel. And so I always come back to 1 Peter 3.15, uh, which reads, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, of course, that reason is Jesus. But I think that also what this verse is saying is always be ready to give a defense. And what is a defense? A defense is an answer to an attack. And when you tell them you believe in God, they're going to attack you on a bunch of different things. And the defenses come both from the Bible, from the gospel, but we can also have rational defenses too that can sometimes get those people before they believe. Because if they don't believe at all, you know, nothing we say that God did is going to change their mind. It's, you know, they have to at first at least accept the idea that God could exist. So what we're going to do today, what I'm going to do is talk in two parts. So the first part, we're going to look at the history of philosophy. What is it? How did it begin? How has it evolved? And what is it today? And then the second part, which will be the more meaty part that we'll get into, is going to be philosophy and apologetics. I'm going to talk about a few of the popular arguments that are out there, because talking about all of them would take a lot longer than, than I've been given. And, um, and we're also going to look at a couple of the challenges that you, or at least one of the big challenges that you'll face when you get into some of these discussions with people. So, and I'm flipping here too, because I don't have a preview slide. So let's go on to the first part, which is what is philosophy? So philosophy is defined as the systematized study of general and fundamental questions, such as those about existence, reason, knowledge, values, mind, and language. It comes from the original Greek word philosophia, which means a love of wisdom. And we know a few folks in the Bible who sought wisdom. Wisdom's very highly held in the Bible. And as we seek wisdom from God, um, there are many who've come before us who've written a great deal that we can always follow up on. Um, so when you think of philosophy, what do most people think of when you say the word philosophy? What do you think pops into most people's heads? Probably dead guys in togas, 
Yep. Somewhere along the line, some guys in ancient Greece got the idea that thinking about stuff would be a pretty good idea, and they started formalizing philosophy. But um, as we know, it was not just the Greeks. In fact, philosophy appeared pretty much all around the world. You know, there were philosophers in Asia like Lao Tzu. There were Incan philosophers. We don't have, I don't have a name for one, but there were um, a great deal of writings found in ancient uh, Inca sites. They were in Native American sites, Japan, Russia, you know, the Middle East, Africa, you name it. There were philosophers everywhere because philosophy is essentially a search for truth and wisdom. And pretty much every civilization has tried this. Now, clearly, those who didn't have the Lord, when they sought that wisdom, they would sometimes inadvertently invent religions, right? You might come up with Buddhism or something along that nature, which then expands. But at their core, they were still trying to define what's true about life, what's true about our universe, and what's true about what we live in. Now, we're blessed to know that truth and can share it with people, but we have to understand that all these attempts were attempts to find that. And then we also had a lot more that came along in between. So it wasn't just in ancient times, because a lot of people tend to think of philosophy as being an old thing that you study, something from a long time ago. But it wasn't just that case. Um, there have been many of them, like St. Anselm, there was St. Thomas Aquinas, who's very, very popular in uh, philosophy of religion for a lot of the writings he did in the early days. You had um, some more secular ones, like Rene Descartes, who, of course, coined the famous, I think, therefore I am, um, and many, many others throughout the years, whose thoughts that, while maybe not directly related at religion, did end up getting moved into both of them and worked through both of them as philosophers continued to think through ideas. Um, and then, of course, we got philosophers in the modern age. So, I mean, Karl Marx was a philosopher, and as we said, he caused a lot of trouble. So sometimes philosophies can be bad. And then you've got modern day ones like William Lane Craig, who's a, who I have him down as the rock star Christian philosopher. There's him and Alvin Plantinga and some others that I'll mention throughout the day that are at the forefront of modern uh, philosophy of religion and put forth some amazingly well thought out arguments. In fact, they will write an entire book about that thick on one argument to make one case. So um, they're fascinating reads, and most of them, interestingly enough, are on YouTube and on uh, other podcasts and things. You can actually listen uh, to some of their discussions. So, there are several branches of philosophy, and I'm going to look at just four of them right now, um, that, again, all of them kind of tie in together as we talk about it. So, one of them, of course, is metaphysics. Metaphysics is the study of the features of reality, such as existence, time, objects, and properties of those objects. So, some people might call this nonsense, right? <laughs> they might that it, you're just arguing about stuff to argue about stuff that doesn't matter, that doesn't make any sense. But here's the thing. Every single one of us knows that metaphysical objects exist. Even if you're not a believer in, in God, you know metaphysical objects exist because of the simple reason that we can do math. Okay? You can add 2 plus 2 and know that it's 4. But can any of you point me to 2? Can you show me a 2? No, you can't. You can show me two things. You can show me two objects, but you can't show me two. But we know it's there. We know that that logic holds up. And, I mean, we can do things. We can have architecture, medicine, computers. We have all these things because these metaphysical objects exist. And so if they didn't exist, we wouldn't have any of that. Um, so those questions are important. And, of course, you, you do get into some you know, weird ones in there, too, especially in the metaphysics. You get into the, does anything exist except me question. I mean, everything gets processed in my brain, so are any of you really here, or is it all just happening up here, you know? Yeah, that's, there's some silly ones, but they're, they're kind of fun sometimes to, to go down. Uh, we also have the study of ethics. Okay, ethics is the question of right or wrong. Seems fairly straightforward, but there's a lot of challenges once you get into the question, where do ethics come from, all right? Um, are they made up by people? Are they made up by a group? If they're made up by a particular group, what happens when the group changes? You know, do they, are they naturally given or are they created, right? And if they're simply made up by people, why does anybody bother with them at all? I mean, what does it matter? If ethics are all just made up, what does it matter if I just walk over and punch Dave in the face? Does anybody have any reason to be against me doing that? Except him, maybe. <laughs> but why would the law care if it's all just made up, if he doesn't have any intrinsic value? 
what does it matter? So those are some of the questions that go into ethics. Uh, logic. Logic is the study of reasoning and argument. Basically, if we can't present our arguments with logic and reason, why would anybody listen to us? You know, I could come in and say, you know, I, I believe 100% it's going to rain cats tomorrow out of the sky. Okay, great. You know, why does anybody care if I can't back it up by saying, you know, there's a giant cloud full of cats and let me show you why and they're all going to fall out tomorrow. You know, no one has any reason to believe me. So you have to present sound, rational arguments. Um, and then lastly is epistemology, which I'm not going to get too deep into, but epistemology is basically the study of knowledge. What can we know? How can we know it? What's the extent of what we can know? How do we know what we know? And can we put any actual faith in what we know? And interestingly, one of the problems um, for science in the sense of uh, naturalism and materialism is that if, natural, if material things is all there is, how can you know anything? Because all your brain is doing is just processing uh, chemicals. So how can you actually trust anything it says if that's all there is? So, so interestingly, like I told Mike, I'm already through the first part. So, and it's only been <laughs> 15 minutes, but we're about to get in the meat of it. So I'm actually not going to take a break. We're going to go on to the next part, which is the actual philosophy of religion. All right, and as I said, this is the metaphysical meat of this presentation. So what is the philosophy of religion in particular? Philosophy of religion is primarily focused on the discussion and argument over the existence of God, his nature, and defenses against arguments that would claim that God does not exist. And I did put a little asterisk there that says it's not always Christian, just the general existence of a deity. And I'll get into why that's important later in a couple of the arguments. But the philosophy of religion often uses what we refer to as a cumulative case argument. And this is supposed to be a pile of stuff. It doesn't look that great. But the idea behind the cumulative case argument is that while an individual argument for God may not be 100% convincing, it might be 90% convincing. And then another one might be 80%. And another one might be 95%. But you keep piling one argument and using one argument after another to the point that there's an overwhelming amount of, wow, there's a lot really pointing to the fact that God probably exists. And I can be pretty confident that he does based off the cumulative case. So, um, for instance, and I'm going to actually just read what I wrote here. For instance, we can provide a pretty logical argument um, for why the fact that that chair is there requires a God that moved at the beginning of time. But that still doesn't prove that there was a God at the beginning. That chair sitting there doesn't prove that there was a God there. But the argument can. So, the argument provides a strong rational ground for why God was there. And I'll get into that argument later. I'm going to actually come back to the chair in a little bit. But for people raised in an education system that values naturalism and science, you want to challenge them on the reasons. And you're going to present several of these cases to challenge them on the reason. So as an aside, because I'll refer to it a few times, naturalism, as I'm talking about it, is defined as the assumption that all we can see and touch is all there is, okay? All that exists is the material thing. There's no supernatural. There's nothing driving anything or any of us other than chemical reactions. They're going to happen the way they happen, whether it's in our head, whether it's when the car hits another car and it's a physics you know, thing happening. Um, but later, we're going to look at why that, re why that has some big holes in it, uh, despite it being the primary grounding for most education today, it actually has a lot of holes in it. Um, but first, let's look at how today a philosophical argument is presented before we get into them. So many arguments are presented using the following format. And though the number of each type in the format, the premise, the inference, may vary or be many depending on how complex the argument is. Some can be very simple and some can be very long. You usually begin with the premise. The premise defines evidence of the argument. And I'm going to give an example of this on the next slide. The inference crafts a new statement using one or more of the agreed upon premises. So you're going to put the premise out there and make sure that everybody agrees, yes, these premises are true. We all agree this. Then you're going to make your inference off of that or several inferences. And then you're going to make a conclusion that's a final statement drawn from the inferences and the premises. Okay? And I'll give you an example of a very simple one. So, 
Here's an argument with three premises. Premise one, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. Do you all agree? All right, we're in agreement on that premise. The president of the United States lives in the White House. Still on board? Good. The White House is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. Good? Okay. So from that, we can infer that these statements imply that the White House is located in Washington, D.C. We can also, the statements also imply that the president lives in Washington, D.C. by living in the White House. Correct? So in conclusion, we can state, therefore, the president of the United States lives in the capital of the United States. Now, some of you may actually recognize this as an old logic puzzle format. When you're in school, when you're in elementary school or junior high, you would get these logic puzzles, and it's the same basic idea. And that's where this format, um, it, it comes from this format. And it's just a solid way to back up what you're trying to say and making sure that the listener is following you through every step. And many times when uh, philosophers will argue cases with each other, they may even have disagreements on the premises. And the person may have to end up going back and rewriting one because they realize, well, the way I'm stating this isn't, you know, not everybody's going to agree, so I've got to go back and rework it. And they will rework their arguments over decades trying to figure out the best wording for it to cover all the cases. So the first one we're going to look at, we're going to look at several of the big ones. And this is one of my favorite because it is one of the most simple. It's been around a long time. It's called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. Okay? It was originally, interestingly enough, an argument made by Islamic philosophers back in the Middle Ages. Um, but it's continued being refined through the centuries, and it was adopted in these days by uh, William Lane Craig, who I showed you earlier as one of the Christian philosophers. He took their argument, and he kept working it and editing it, and tuned it until the simplest form that he could come up with, which we see it formatted as today. So here's the Kalam cosmological argument. It's an argument for the existence of God that it, and it originated in the Middle Ages uh, from Islamic philosophers. The premises are two. Premise one, all things which begin to exist have a cause. So let's talk about that one. The chair. The chair began to exist, but it had a cause. A factory made that chair. Right? The tree outside began to exist, but it had a cause, which was a seed. You had a cause. It was your mom and dad. Everything that we can see comes from something, okay? Premise two, the universe began to exist, okay? We know this for a couple of things, and I'm going to go down a little rabbit hole here. Whether you are young Earth, old Earth, whatever, doesn't matter. We all agree that the universe began to exist because either you believe that God said it and it existed, or you believe in a Big Bang, at which point there was still a beginning. It began to exist. And we can also trust in that because, and this is going to get a little deep, so go with me here. You cannot, we know that logically we can't have an infinite regression of events. Because people will say, they'll argue against this premise by saying, well, what if the universe is just infinitely old? What if it's just been here forever and we just happen to be right here? Or maybe there was a universe before this one and before that one and before that one. The problem with that is, while you can deal with infinities in math, dealing with them in reality is logically impossible. Because imagine this, if the universe was infinitely old, and, and it could go back forever, literally infinitely, how would you ever get to today? You would never actually be able to arrive at today because time would be infinitely backwards. So we know there has to have been a point where it started and has moved us through to where we are now. So both of those premises hold, and they've been unable to be challenged, really, by anybody who's taking them seriously. So the conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause, because the universe, we know it began to exist, and we know that it has a cause. So um, therefore, we, we believe that there has to be something that caused it. We call this thing God, because we believe God caused it. So sometimes people will bring up another objection, which is the classic, well, who made God? Or where did God come from? People who ask that don't really seem to understand what we're talking about when we talk about God. Because if you notice, the argument is very careful to say all things which begin to exist. And in the next argument, we'll show why God would not have begun to exist. Therefore, he doesn't qualify under premise one, and he could not be defeated by that. 
So the one we'll follow up with is the next one, the argument from contingency. So this one expands on the Kalam and fills in more about what we know about God through reasoning and in a cumulative case way, like building on the last argument, we're now going to add this argument. It takes a little bit of the concept of that one, but grows it farther. So first, we're gonna, I'm going to define two things. Um, a contingent thing is something that requires another thing to exist. Okay? A banana is contingent on a banana tree. Just like we said, the chair is contingent on the factory. You know, Gideon is contingent on his mom and dad. So <laughs> those are contingent things. The term in philosophy, the other term is a necessary being. A necessary being is something which must exist. It is not, nothing else is required for it to exist. And of course, that's one of God's qualities, is that he is a necessary being. So, this argument originated from Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, which was a great, confusing book written way back a long time ago. But <laughs> the argument basically boils down to, the first two premises are, if something exists, there must exist what it takes for that thing to exist. So for the banana to exist, there must have been the banana tree. For the tree to exist, there must have been the seed. Premise two, the universe, the collection of all beings in space and time, exists. We know that, right? Unless you have some mental difficulties, we can all accept that all these things exist. So therefore, the first conclusion is, therefore, there must exist what it takes for the universe to exist. Okay, so through that argument, you establish that if the universe is here and it exists, there has to be something that made it exist. Okay, so then he moves on to another premise to build on that, which says what it takes for the universe to exist cannot exist within the universe or be bounded by space and time. Because if the thing that existed, that, that made the universe existed in it, it would be basically, for lack of a better term, subject to it. You know, when we look back at um, things like uh, Greek mythology, right, we look at um, uh, Zeus and all the others were birthed from Kronos and, and their mother. Well, then he turned around and killed Kronos, which meant that his lightning, which is part of our universe, was able to kill him, which means he's subject to, you know, forces within it. He's not above it. And so the way we look at God is by being outside of it. And that's where we get the final conclusion, which is, therefore, what, what it takes for the universe to exist must transcend both space and time. He's not subject to it. He could have been here before it existed. In fact, there's no concept of before with God, which goes back to that argument they make, well, what made God? What was around before God? Well, there was no before him, because he's not within the idea of space and time. So, uh, let me see here. Oftentimes in philosophy, you will hear this referred to as an unmoved mover, but it's basically the same concept as God, something that cannot be acted upon, but can act in that sense. So, so then we have the one called the argument from design, which is sometimes called the argument from beauty, but I prefer argument from design. So essentially, um, it goes like this, and this is kind of small and it's not formatted in the same way because it's a slightly different presentation, but um, this is an argument from, for the existence of an intelligent deity. So if you notice, on, all, on both those other um, arguments, all we argued was that something started the universe and that thing was outside of the universe, but we haven't actually established what it is or any aspects of it other than the fact that it's immensely powerful and exists outside of space and time. This argument begins to build on the idea that that thing um, must be intelligent as well. It must have a mind. It must be thinking and have a reason for what it's doing. So the first uh, line is that the universe displays a staggering amount of intelligibility, meaning we can look at things and see just how complex they are. Um, a lot of people like to point at an eyeball and how complex an eyeball is, and what it, how much is required to go on to do what it does. But it's not even something that small. It's the conditions of our planet, 
that we are exactly where we are in the solar system, that we are not two inches further or closer to the sun, which would have made life impossible to exist here. Um, not only that, but how much has to happen every day just for your body to work? There's a bajillion things happening and decisions being made constantly by organs that are drastically different from one another, all to make your body work so you can get up in the morning and eat Cocoa Krispies, right? I mean, it's mind-boggling what goes into that. So the second statement says either this in intelligible order is the product of chance or an intelligent design. So the next premise is not chance, and I've got an asterisk there, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Statement four, therefore the universe is the product of an intelligent design. Number five, design only comes from the mind of a designer. You can't have the design for a boat suddenly appear. Someone has to think that through, come up with the design, come up with the plans. Um, of course, we can have computers that are getting better now at, you know, hey, design a boat for me, but someone still had to put that information in that computer. It's not coming up with it on its own. Um, it all has to be put there, so it has to come from a mind. Therefore, we can conclude that the universe is the product of a mind. There is something behind it that is planning it and planning it for a reason and put it together in the way that it works for a reason. Now, I do note that number three, where it says this is not chance instead of uh, it's intelligible order, not chance, is probably the weakest part of the argument and where it gets attacked the most. Um, because it really hinges, the whole argument hinges on point three. Because if, if you accept that it was chance, then the rest of it falls apart, right? Um, however, the claim that it results from chance, while not impossible, is so mind-bogglingly small that it's nearly impossible. Could the elements of a single chain of a protein have happened to have bounced together randomly? Yes, it could have. The chance of that happening is so astronomically small that even if you accept the idea that science puts forth now that the universe is 60 billion-ish years old, mathematically, it still should not have even happened yet for a single one to have come together. Not, you know, needless to say, everything you see. It's so incredibly small that you can almost just go ahead and say it's, it's effectively impossible to, to, to have been by chance. But, and I'll just say this as an aside, when we're arguing, we have to be honest about holes like that. We can't just say, oh, no, it's, it's impossible that it was chance. It wasn't impossible, but it's effectively impossible. And then show them why, you know, it was. Um, a counter to that objection that, that I find really good is the idea that to understand chance, you have to understand a backdrop of order. You don't even know what random chance is if you don't know what order underlies it. So you have to know how it should have occurred in order to understand how it could have occurred. And if you take away the order and speak about the chance as the only source of what could have happened, then you've taken away everything that allows you to even understand the concept of chance at all. Which goes back to that idea of the naturalism thing, which I'm gonna talk about for a second, which was, for the people who argue that the universe began by random chance, what they're saying is that there's no reason for any of it, that it all happened naturally, that you are the result of random genetic uh, mixing and molecules, and every thought you have is just random neurons firing based off of stimuli from outside. And if that's the case, if it was all just random, why can, how can we trust anything we believe, right? Because we believe that you shouldn't kill somebody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go for the, the home run for the really far one. We believe you shouldn't kill somebody, right? But if everything's just random, how can we even trust that the idea that we shouldn't kill someone is valid? Because it's just neurons firing in our head. Our emotions are just neurons firing in our head. They don't mean anything. So let's just do whatever we want. And we, but we know that's not true. Everybody kind of knows that inherently, whether they admit it or not. 
as long as they don't have a, you know, an emotional mental defect, everybody seems to know that hurting people is wrong. Helping people is right. You know, we see babies, we respond to them, we want to take care of them. It's just, it just happens. And so that, again, while that's not a 100% proof, it's a pretty heavy evidence that, you know, we do have something more than just the randomness taking care of us. You go back through history, you know, you go to any country in, in the history of the world and you look at a mom and you're going to find a mom who doesn't care about her baby. It's going to be really hard to find one. You might have some cultures that were messed up, but that's a cultural thing. That's not, you know, the inherency is still there for the mom to care for her child, um, just like most animals do. So, um, okay, so now, the last of these arguments I'm going to talk about is the ontological argument. So this one, I'll admit, as I say, is kind of a brain burner. So I'm going to try and take it slow and buckle up because it gets weird. Um, it is one of the most confusing arguments to grasp, and there are volumes upon volumes upon volumes <laughs> written about this. Um, the original argument was originated by St. Anselm back in the Middle Ages, and it has been reconstituted by the modern philosopher Alvin Platenga. Um, so i got to define a couple of terms before I bring it up. So he uses the term maximal. Okay, Maximal means that if a thing is maximal in one aspect, there can be nothing greater imagined in that aspect. So for instance, if we said that the Flash, the superhero, is the fastest superhero, he's the maximal fast superhero. If we can imagine and create in our head a superhero who is faster than the Flash, that hero is now the maximal fast superhero. So no matter what we can imagine, the one that we can't get beyond is the maximal. So um, let me finish this out. There's going to be two terms you see here. One's called maximal excellence. Okay? Maximal excellence, as Dr. Platenga defines it, is to have om omnipotence, omniscience, and moral perfection in some imaginable world. Okay? We're going to get into the idea of thinking about variants of, of worlds here. So maximal excellence means to have omnipotence, omniscience, and moral perfection in some world that you can imagine. Maximal greatness means to have maximal excellence in every possible world that you can think of, okay? So there's excellence in one, greatness is excellence across all of them, okay? So here goes the argument. The premise, there is a possible world that we can imagine where there is a being with maximal greatness, meaning there is a possible world we can imagine where there is a being that is maximally excellent across, or maximally great across every world, okay? So imagine like three Earths, or three universes, and in this one universe we can imagine there's a being that's great across all of them, okay? The inference is that a being is maximally great only if it has maximal excellence in every possible world. That's part of the definition of that. The conclusion is, Therefore, it is maximally great only if it has omnipotence, omniscience, and moral perfection in every possible world. Okay, so we've defined maximally great at that point. This thing is the best no matter what alternate world you put it in. It's the top, right? So, here's our inference from that. And this is where it gets a little more weird. If in any world you can imagine the proposition there is no omnipotent, omniscient, or morally perfect being would be impossible. It's necessarily false. Okay? And the other inference is, but what's impossible does not vary from world to world. If something's impossible, it's impossible. It can't be. So when that statement that it, it's impossible for there to be, quote, God, can't be because we can perceive a world where there is him. Okay. So therefore, the conclusion is the proposition there is no omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect being is necessarily false in our actual world too. 
because it's false across all possible worlds, our actual world being one of the possible worlds. Therefore, there actually exists in this world and must exist in every possible world an omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being. Okay? That was a lot. It's all right. I don't, I don't, I still struggle with it sometimes. But the basics, as, as I think I can boil it down, is the idea that if we can understand that, that there is a morally perfect being that can exist in any possible world, it must exist in our actual world. And when I say in our world, I'm not referring to him being part of our universe. I'm just part of our existence, right? He's outside of our universe. We know that, but um, he is part of our existence. So, um, also it comes down to another argument that ties into that that says that if you can imagine a maximally great being to be the most perfect, maximal great being, it has to exist. Because not existing would be a detriment. So, otherwise it wouldn't be maximally great if it didn't actually exist. So, all right, so, let's see, where are we at? We're doing good. I might, I might run this about an hour. So next, huh? You want me to do a song and dance? What are you saying? Drag it out a little more? Yeah, let's take a break. Let's take a break before we get to the next part. The next part will be short, but we'll take a break. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So those were uh, four arguments we looked at. Now, there are many, many more. That is by no means all the arguments philosophies come up with in favor of God. There's a lot more. Um, you can find them online. You know, there's lots of websites that have uh, repositories for them. Some of them very simplistic. Some of them really, really deep and spread out versions of them. Um, but those are four of the big ones um, and four of the more popular ones that you see taken up in argument a lot. So, however, there are arguments in philosophy against the belief in God, and I think there's at least one we should talk about because it's one that you're going to run into almost all the time, and that is the problem of evil. And I like to say that we're going to play this one on challenge mode instead of easy mode <laughs> because it is not an argument that we can simply dismiss out of hand. It is a very real thing for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to explain it. For, I'm going to go through it first, and then we'll talk about why. So it's a very simple, short one, okay? It's an argument against God's nature, not his existence, okay? Um, and it's unclear in its origin where it began because it seems to have existed all through time. Uh, the premise is pretty simple. Evil exists. We can all agree that, right? We see horrible things happen to people all the time. We see horrible people do things all the time. Um, we see uh, tragedies that happen to people that never, you know, they had nothing to do with it. They were totally innocent in it. Um, they just happened to live in the wrong place, and they got bombed out, right? They lost their kids. Evil happens. We know it. So the conclusion that they come to off of that is, therefore, God must either be unable to stop evil if he wants to, or be unwilling to stop evil, which would conclude that he's not as good as he claims he is, because he's okay with it. Now, for us, we know God as Christians. We know Jesus. We know that, but... This is a very real struggle for lots of people who may otherwise be willing to accept that God exists. They can't bring themselves to believe that he's actually good, that he actually cares about anyone because look outside your window. I mean, you know, some people, it, it could be even something as simple as, look what that dog's doing to that squirrel. It's literally slamming it against the ground. I mean, that squirrel's going through the most horrible death imaginable right now. Why is God allowing that? Why didn't he make the dog not need to kill the squirrel? Why did, why did my daughter need to get hit by a car and be crippled the rest of her life? You know, not that, that happened to me, praise the Lord. I'm just using that as an example. These things happen every day, and we go through this. We know it's because of a fallen world, but if you don't accept Christ and Christianity any, anyway, it's a big, big wall to get over, okay? So it also extends to the idea that if he's fully loving, but he's unable to stop the evil, then that means he's not all-powerful, and he can't help me out of whatever, because he can't do it. He can't stop it. If a guy's going to try to shoot me today, it's going to happen, because God can't do anything about it. However, if he is able to stop the evil, but he doesn't do so, 
then he doesn't really all, he's not really all loving because an all loving and morally perfect being would be unable to tolerate a child starving in the desert in Africa to death, um, despite that child or their parents' choices. If he was fully love, how could he let that happen, right? So, um, and in fact, at, at the far end of this argument, if you look at it as a bell curve, at the far end of the bell curve, you have some people who will state outright and argue that due to the experience we have in this world that we go through, God may exist. He may actually just be evil. He may have made this world just to watch us suffer through it. You know? So, however, earlier, uh, I mentioned Dr. Alvin Platinga. He's another Christian philosopher. He put together a really solid rebuttal to the problem of evil in his book titled God, Freedom, and Evil. So, essentially, he asserts that God, while all-powerful, cannot do literally anything, okay? He can't act against his own nature, okay? God is good. God is love. He can't harm someone just for the glee of harming them because his nature is love and good. God is truth. We know this. There's truth in the word. God is truth. He can't lie. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't do it because he is truth. It exists and, and there's a whole separate line of philosophical argument of, as to whether truth exists in him or he is literally truth. Like, there's not a separation between the two. Um, God can't create things that break the logic of the reality he's created. He can't create a circle that's shaped like a square, because then it would be a square. It wouldn't be a circle. Um, more importantly... Um, and this goes back to that old classic argument, could God make a rock so big he couldn't pick it up? Well, no, he can't. It's a log- the, the argument's dumb. It's a logical impossibility. You're, you're asking for something that's not logically possible. Now, miracles exist. He can do miracles. He can bring people back from the dead. He can do all that kind of stuff, but that's not illogical. We're talking about illogical things. Like, he can't, one of the ones I heard that was very funny, he can't create a married bachelor. <laughs> You can't be both, right? It's impossible. So there are limits to what he can do in the logical sense. So more importantly, God cannot create a truly free-willed creature that will never, ever choose to do evil, right? So he then argued that God must have a morally justifying reason to allow for human free will, even knowing what we're going to do with it. There must be a credible offset to the amount of evil that we see and endure on a daily basis for him to have made us free. Um, We may not be able to perceive what that is. I mean, we're not God. We're not him. We may never have the answer to that this this side of the world. But if we know he's good and we believe that he's good, then we have to believe that there is a offset a reason for what we go through and the, what we're having to go through, no matter how bad it may be. And maybe not everybody's going to accept that argument, right? The person whose daughter is literally crippled in the hospital for the rest of her life may not be able to accept that there's a justified reason for what's going on. Through her. We may hear stories about that. We hear stories about the person who lost their child in the nursery and at the, at the hospital, and then three nurses came to Christ. We understand that. We get that. Your average person may not. But this is the beginning of an attempt to counter that. So we're blessed because we know that God has bought our way out of this evil. Um, But there is, as an aside, kind of a uh, fun argument as to why God can't be evil. And I'm going to go through this one because it's kind of fun. Um, As we were talking about earlier, we define God as a maximal being. He's the, the most at whatever you can imagine he is, okay? So, if he's love, he has the most love of anything you could possibly imagine. If he's truth, he has the most truth of anything you can possibly imagine. And we, we believe this as Christians. I, I think we all do, right? Anybody? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> just making sure. I don't want to make too many assumptions. But um, now, imagine the idea that God had even the slightest hint of evil in him. 
that would mean that he is suddenly the most maximally evil creature you could possibly imagine because he is maximal in every way. So if there's even a hint of evil in him, he is so horrible and so evil, but we experience love. We experience happiness. If he was the maximally evil being, do you think he could even tolerate the fact that any of us were happy for even half a second? No, he wouldn't be able to handle it. He'd be wanting to hurt us constantly. But interestingly enough on that, we know that selfishness, greed, is an aspect of evil. If he were the most maximally selfish creature in existence, he wouldn't even be able to make us. He wouldn't be able to tolerate the fact that there's anything except him because he would be so selfish. And so when we, when we work that back, it's interesting to see that if he even had a tiniest bit of evil in him, he wouldn't be able to even, we wouldn't even be able to exist right now, which is a pretty interesting way to go against the idea that God is just toying with us and putting us through all this just for giggles, you know, as some people might, might believe. So, in conclusion, because we're actually at the conclusion in an hour, wow, um, the cumulative cases, we can go to great lengths to try to break down the walls that some non-believers have to why God couldn't exist. Um, it's also reasonable to believe that just because evil exists in this world, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, that he's not working for our good. And what's great is that once there's that little chip in the wall to the idea that a God is rational and reasonable to believe in, then you've got the place to start inserting, well, let me tell you why my God is the one that fits all these categories. There's nothing bigger than him. He's outside the universe. He made it. He made the beginning of it. He was powerful enough to do it. He's love. He cares about us. He made us. He's not out to hurt us. And here's why. And then you can show in the gospel how he went to great lengths sending Christ, his own son, you know, as a sacrifice to make amends for us. Um, and I'll end with a quote from Dr. Craig, which is funny enough bringing it around on all this. It says, more often than not, it is what you are rather than what you say that will bring an unbeliever to Christ. This then is the ultimate apologetic, for the ultimate apologetic is your life. It's good to be able to argue this stuff. It's good to be able to present a strong case. But at the end of the day, even the, the best of these people agree, what you do day to day is going to be the main thing. It's going to be your, your uh, message to others, your apologetic to others. And that's that. That's my, that's my presentation.